Hello everybody. In this lecture summary I'd just like to talk a little bit about reactive oxygen and reactive nitrogen species and a little bit about redox signaling. Clearly there are two types of chemically reactive species that um, are discussed in the textbook. These are reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species. We've already talked about reactive nitrogen in terms of nitric oxide as a signaling molecule and there is still debate in the literature as to how significant reactive oxygen are in signaling pathways. So nitric oxide has been shown to be an important signaling molecule um, but it's also a free radical. It has a short lifespan and as we know it can diffuse across membranes. So here's a little figure from the textbook which shows the um, synthesis of nitric oxide within a cell. So from arginine there's an intermediate in the conversion to citrulline and this intermediate includes a guanidine group that has been oxidized which can then give rise to the nitric oxide. So as, as we, I just mentioned nitric oxide is able to pass through the membranes so nitric oxide can leave the cell it was made and diffuse into another cell within its short half-life. Now nitric oxide has the ability to activate guanyl cyclase. So here we have nitric oxide traversing the cell into another cell to activate guanyl cyclase. Now as you recall guanyl cyclase converts GTP to cyclic GMP in the same way that adenylcyclase converts ATP to cyclic AMP. In this diagram it's also shown that the cyclic GMP is broken down to GMP by a phosphodiesterase and we discussed in the lectures that Viagra was an inhibitor of the phosphodiesterase leading to elevated levels of cyclic GMP. And one of the things that cyclic GMP can do in the cell is to activate some other enzyme activities such as kinases for some cellular effect. So what one of the major sources of reactive oxygen species has been known for some time and reactive oxygen in this situation derives from NADPH oxidase complex. So here's the NADPH oxidase complex in with these proteins and then and the NADPH oxidase is able to convert molecular oxygen into superoxide and this sort of oxidative burst generated by the cells is used to kill off bacteria cells. So it's been known for a long time that reactive oxygen can be produced within cells and it's also been known for a long time that reactive oxygen are damaging within cells. Another source of reactive oxygen species in the cell is the leakage of electrons during the electron transport chain. So during the um, reduction of molecular oxygen to water you can get the release of superoxide. Superoxide can then be converted to other reactive oxygen species within the cell such as hydrogen peroxide and the hydroxy radical. So this is just showing um, the reduction of molecular oxygen to superoxide and its conversion to hydrogen peroxide. This conversion occurs due to an enzyme called superoxide dismutase which is helping to remove these damaging compounds from cells. Hydrogen peroxide can then go on to damage proteins, particularly um, cysteine residues are susceptible to hydrogen peroxide oxidation and there are mechanisms within, within the cell to try and protect protein damage from hydrogen peroxide. Namely we have glutathione that can pick up the hydrogen peroxide and it will be oxidized to, um, to protect proteins within the cell. There's also other reactions that can occur in the cell which we don't need to go into too much detail about but the important thing here is that the hydrogen peroxide can be converted into a more dangerous free radical 
which can then damage proteins and lipids and DNA. So the, the, the body has a mechanism to convert the hydrogen peroxide into water and this process involves glutathione. So as I just mentioned in that previous slide, hydrogen peroxide and superoxide per se are not particularly reactive within the cell. A far more serious problem is the conversion of hydrogen peroxide to the hydroxy radical since the hydroxy radical is very reactive and has the ability to interact and damage many cellular constituents. So to protect cells from damage, cells contain in high concentration a small tripeptide called glutathione. Now glutathione consists of glycine which is shown here. So this is your this is the glycine um, then a peptide bond onto cysteine and then an unusual linkage of a glutamic acid to the amine group of this of the cysteine. So glutathione contains a reactive cysteine here and it's able to mop up the reactive oxygen and it becomes oxidized into um, GSSH is two glutathione molecules cross-linked together by the um, disulfide bond. So assuming some of this reactive oxygen is able to damage proteins in the cell, then these cysteine side chains of proteins become oxidized into a sulfenic acid by the reactive oxygen. The sulfenic acid can then undergo a reaction to form a sulfenyl amide group which can react with glutathione and then glutathione can remove the oxidative damage from the protein and the glutathione itself becomes oxidized as a consequence. So effectively we, what we have here is a protein or enzyme containing a SH group which is damaged by reactive oxygen into the sulfenic acid group, as I've just shown you. And then this can go on to be further oxidized, or it can form this sulfenyl amide group, which can then be recovered by glutathione. This has been thought to protect cells from oxidative damage, but the textbook is also raising the question that this could also act, that, that these derivatives could also act as signaling molecules within the cell. Now, a fair bit of research on reactive oxygen species has been carried out in um, Cerevisiae, in, in baker's yeast, budding yeast, and there's been a range of responses have been observed. One of the more interesting responses is the fact that a transcription factor is activated in response to oxidative stress. So exposure of cells to hydrogen peroxide leads to the accumulation of a transcription factor called GAP1 in the nucleus. And then while GAP1 is in the nucleus, it's able to transcribe genes that are required for the oxidant defense response. So here we have a schematic showing the yeast cell response to hydrogen peroxide. So in green here, we have a sensor protein, which picks up the oxidative damage due to the hydrogen peroxide. And then we have this damaged oxidized intermediate. This sensor protein then interacts with YAP1 to form an oxidized intermediate and then transfer the oxidative damage, if you like, onto the, the YAP1 transcription factor. This transcription factor can then move into the nucleus, activate genes responsible for oxidants defense, and then over time you have a recycling of the transcription factor back into the cytosol. All right, well I hope that helps you a little with your um, understanding of reactive oxygen and nitrogen in the cells and some of the ideas around these molecules for signaling. Thank you.